How can I say thanks? Just today I want to share with you some thoughts that uh, during this week I thought about Thanksgiving and you know one of the challenges for preachers is uh, as the years go by and you come to the same holidays, Christmas, you come to Thanksgiving, you come to you know Mother's Day and all of those things that repeat, you have 40 years of preaching on those very seasons and so you kind of after a while, it gets to be a challenge. What do I want to talk about without repeating myself uh, that I haven't, have not spoken about in 40 years? And so this week, as I'm, or a week ago, as I'm meditating upon the scriptures, and I, you all know I love David, um, somehow I feel some pulse in my heart when I meditate upon this man's life. And uh, some thoughts about something he said triggered today's message that I want to share with you. And it is not, if you listen to the theme of thanksgiving, it is always invariably about something good, something positive. And so, I believe this, these thoughts and that we will share from David as the Holy Spirit helps me will take us to a higher level of praise, to a higher level of thanksgiving, to a level that is not contingent upon just good things happening to us, but take us to a level where thanksgiving becomes a way of life. So I want to share these thoughts from this man. In quick background to the scripture, David is now seated upon the throne of Israel. He's somewhere around 30 to 33 years, almost like the, the age of that Jesus was when he kind of began his itinerant ministry at 30. He had now been enthroned as king over all of Israel. And he had a beautiful palace built for him. A palace made out of cedar and gold and all the wonderful stuff that were brought in and donated by the kings and the nations around. And the building was done. And he sits now upon his throne. And he watches out over the expanse of the kingdom. And he sees that his nation is finally at rest. The Philistine threat had been subdued. All the uprisings have been subdued. The nation is at rest. It is at the height of economic prosperity. Everyone is happy. For the first time in a long, long time from the days of Saul... Over 20-something years, finally, there is peace. There is prosperity. He sits upon the throne in this brand new palace that is built for him. With its golden arms and lions at the side, attended by his advisors and people waving fans over his head. And dancers and people serving meals. And this, it was just a wonderful time of peace. Everyone was enjoying the goodness of the Lord. But as he sat there, he did not share that same kind of joy. Like all the people were. 
As he sat there as king and he looked upon all the festivities and he looked upon the people and, and, and considered where they're at, one would think that he would be equally joyous, but he wasn't. And the reason that he was not happy was because he said in his own words, here I am seated in a beautiful palace made of cedar and the ark of the Lord lies somewhere in a tent. The ark of the Lord was the symbol of God's presence in the Old Testament days. Wherever they carried the ark, that was the symbol of God's presence. And here he's, he's saying, I am here seated in this beautiful palace and the ark lies somewhere in a tent in some corner. And he said, that is not right. Something is wrong here. And so he calls the prophet Nathan and he says to him, as you are aware, the ark of the Lord lies out in a tent somewhere. And here I am. Seated in a palace. The priorities are wrong. I am going to build a place, a temple for the Lord. More glorious than this that I have. What do you think? And Nathan said, sounds like a good idea. Go ahead, build it. And so David was like, yeah, I'm going to start right away. But that night the Lord appeared to the prophet Nathan and said to him, yeah, you know, you stepped out in faith and you, you, you suggested that it was okay, but no, you can't build it. You need to go back to him and tell him, I will allow his family to build it. His house will build it. His posterity will build it, but not him, because he is a man of blood, a military man who has shed much blood, and because of that, he cannot, I will not allow him to build me a temple. And so Nathan had this message to go back the next day to tell David that I'm sorry. That I suggested, I said it was okay. But the Lord says, it is all right, but you are not going to build it. How would you react to a message like that? How did David react? It probably conjured Memories of his whole life back to him in that moment. Memories of a life of rejection. As he sat there and watched Nathan walk away after leaving him that message that you can't build this. His whole life, I believe, began to pass before him. From the time he was born, he seemed to have been a life that was going to be marked by rejection. In Psalm 51, he says, In sin did my mother conceive me. And I was shaped 
in iniquity, in wickedness. In sin did my mother conceive me. David is not talking about universal depravity here. He's not talking about all of us in the world are sinners. He's not making a reference to original sin when he says, in sin did my mother conceive me. Had he been saying that, he would have said, in sin we were all conceived. And in sin we were all shaped. This is part of his of his prayer of repentance after he had committed sin and was against Bathsheba and Uriah and was confronted by the prophet. He wrote Psalm 51, and so he's reflecting. And this was going to be a good place to say, yeah, I sin because we are all sinners. But it wasn't about universal depravity. He said, in sin did my mother conceive me. This was personal. This was about him. And I shared with you at some point in time, every now and again, injecting some thoughts concerning David's, David's upbringing. And I believe this man, from the time he was born, he was rejected. Conceived in sin. This is the first week I've really thought about it and tried to figure out who is this boy's mother. Search your scriptures and you will find that the greatest king Israel ever had, the man after whom even Jesus Christ would call himself a son, the son of David, and you will not find a reference to who his mother was. It's like he didn't have a mother. If there is anybody that, that somebody famous, if someone comes along who's famous, the first thing we get to know at least about them is who their mother was. And here's the greatest king that Israel has ever seen, the anti-type, the type of Jesus Christ. And there is no mention of a mother, of who his mother was. Nothing. The Talmud tried to project some name of somebody. That's not inspired. That's just speculation. The scriptures that you have in your hands offer nothing concerning this boy's mother. Maybe she was a prostitute. He was conceived in sin and wickedness, raised in lawlessness, and rejected. Think about this. When he came to fight Goliath, when he came to bring food for his brothers at the battleground, as the Israel was up against the Philistines, And you know the story of David and Goliath. And he saw that no one was taking up the challenge of Goliath. And he said to Saul, I'm going to fight. Arm me. Give me permission. I'll fight. And Saul says, how are you going to fight? You, that man is a giant. You're a skinny little kid. That man is a career soldier. How are you going to fight him? And David went into his little back pocket and pulled out his little piece of resume. He said, this is my resume. One day, I was taking out my father's sheep, and a bear attacked, and I grabbed the bear, and I beat him to pulp and killed it. Another time, I was tending my father's sheep, and a lion attacked, and I grabbed it, and I ripped its jaw apart. 
I killed it. This was no muscular guy. When Goliath saw him, Goliath began to laugh and Goliath said, Who is that skinny boy that you are sending to me to fight me with sticks? Some of you, many, many of you here mothers. Let me take you into the picture. I'm trying to establish who this boy is. And we're getting to somewhere, hopefully. Holy Spirit is taking us somewhere. Your mother and your little skinny boy, your last child, comes home. You can't beat, you can't kill a lion, and there's no scrape on you. There's no blood on your clothes. And you come in, and nobody asks, what were you doing? How did that blood get on you? Or you happen to tell your parents or your siblings, you know, I just killed a lion today. And no one says, well, why did you fight a lion? Why did you risk your life? Why did you jeopardize your life for a sheep? You could have another sheep. It's just the sheep. You are more important. Isn't that what a mother would have said? Now think for a moment that this happened twice. So if it had happened after the first time, when it was against the bear or the lion, I don't know which one was first, but you came home and there's blood all over you and maybe scrapes. And the mother would say, okay, you know what? You need to understand you can't do this stuff. Your life is more important. It's just the sheep. So next time a beast comes, you leave the sheep and you run. The fact I'm projecting with my sanctified imagination today, the fact that this happened a second time meant that nobody cared when it happened the first time. And it's not too far-fetched to imagine that they wished he were dead. It is not coincidence, by coincidence, that David is the eighth son. Seven is the biblical number of perfection. So eight speaks of redundancy. Being unwanted. The accident in the family. Pretty much antitypical of Jesus Christ. He's the great type of Jesus. And it's no wonder that Jesus is referred to as the son of David. And Jesus quoted this man so often, even down to the very last words on the cross. He began to quote David. He identified with David in his life, in his rejection. He came to his own and his own received him not. A life of rejection. We love to talk about the birth story, the Christmas story, and the birth of Jesus. But we lose sight of what Mary went through, what Jesus went through. I posit to you today that Jesus went through school, kindergarten, elementary, as a rejected child. As a bastard child. You tell me. Which one of those people in Bethlehem. Would have believed. That Mary gave birth to this boy. By some ghost. When she was engaged to a man. He 
he would have lived with rejection. His whole life was one of rejection. He came to the palace. Eventually, Saul sent for him after the defeat of Goliath. He came to the palace, and Saul tried to kill him. Several occasions, Saul tried to kill him. He eventually drove him out of the palace, drove him into exile, left him out there. Everyone began to take their eyes past him. Nabal said, you deserve what you're getting. Things became so bad for him. This is the man who led Israel into battle, victory after victory. When Saul would slay his thousands, David would slay his ten thousands. He was the national hero. The man who kept Israel dominant. Yet when the king exiled him, threw him out of je- because of jealousy, the nation forgot him. No one cared that he was in the wilderness. 400 people joined him who were in debt, in despair, and discontentment. And he had to take care of those 400 people and their families in a wilderness. A man who would be king. Doing security services for people with their livestock. Hoping just to get a little something to eat. Eventually. Years later. Judah would come and make him king. And then Israel would make him king. But then he becomes king, and he makes a mistake, and it costs him dearly again. He kills Uriah, commits adultery with Bathsheba, and a sword came into his house. One of his sons from another wife, Amnon, raped Tamar. The other son took revenge. Absalom came and killed Amnon. Absalom ran into exile and plotted a revenge and come to seize his father's throne. The rebellion of Absalom cost him his life. In that rebellion, David's chief minister, a man called Ahitophel, this man comes and he gives advice. He betrays David and goes to Absalom and tells Absalom what he should do in order to overthrow his father, including, I want you to go and publicly rape every one of your father's concubines. Do it in public. Let the whole nation see. When all of that was over, And Absalom was dead. And all the rebellions were over. And everything was done. A man by the name of Sheba. Nobody knows who this man is. This man comes out of the woodworks. And he says to the people. He blew a trumpet. And he said to the nation of the ten tribes of Israel. We have no part in David. David is from Judah. Let's secede. And these ten nations of morons, they decide to go and follow this man named Sheba. This was the life of this man. If David had to put in one hand all the good things in his life, and in the other hand all the bad things, he would have volumes in this hand with bad things. And he would perhaps have less than half a page of good things. But he sits upon the throne with all the bad things weighing down, a whole life of rejection weighing down in his hand, a few little things in his hand of good. And he says, Then the king sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord, and what is my house 
that you have brought me thus far. O Salabashu Komonteri. This is the man sitting there on that throne. Pile high of a life of trouble, pain, suffering. He looks down at the ground at the half a page of the good things. He says, Who am I, O oh God? That you would be bring me this far. We have to beg people to worship. We have to push people to be grateful. We have to find nice things to be thankful. We have not understood what gratitude is. That is the mark of thanksgiving. He understood that the basis of thanksgiving is not having things or all good things. He understood the basis of thanksgiving is that I have life, the goodness of God. I'm alive. You have brought me this far. Brought me this far. He understood that life is a journey. On that journey, there are hills and there are valleys. There are potholes, some deep enough to cause some serious damage to you. But all of it is part of the journey. A couple of times every year for the past 20 something years, my wife and I have been driving to New York. All of our family lives there. So invariably, we go for something or the other. And one of the things that occur to me that happens every time I return home or I get to New York City whilst driving, when I get there, and I pull into that driveway of my mother-in-law's house or my own house when I get back. I sit on that driveway and I say, thank you, God, for bringing me this far. I don't say, God, I thank you for the good parts of the journey, but I don't I'm unhappy that between Rochester and Syracuse, there was rain. So I'm not happy for that part of the journey. I don't say, I thank you for bringing me for all the good parts of that journey, but not for the pothole at Yonkers. I recognize it's a journey, and here I am. And I said that to say this, that when we come to Thanksgiving, our minds are locked in to things that are good, only the pleasant part of our journey. 
We do not see life as a complete journey. That here I am. I still have my health. I still have strength. I still have breath. When many others don't. It should never be a decision when it comes Sunday morning whether we should be in the house of God. That should never be a decision to make. Or anything that we do for God should never be a decision. It should be an automatic response of a life of gratitude. We we need to live with our mindset. Many of us perhaps today are going to go home and we're going to sit around our Thanksgiving table. And I know, for example, my wife would normally year after year as we sit around the table, she would ask us all before we pray and, and, and have our meal about just sharing something for which we are thankful. And all of us, from one, from me, all around, we would all zero in on something good that happened to us. I thank God that this year I had a promotion. I thank God that this year I was able to pay off my student loan. I thank God that this year I found a friend. I got into a good relationship. I thank God for this. I thank God for that. We're always on the positive side of the journey. Our thanksgiving is truncated only to the good things, to the positive things in our lives. And I said early to you today, we are going to move. I believe God wants to take us to a higher level of praise. A higher level. To see life in its, in its entirety. Job saw it that way. David saw it that way. Job said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What is Job doing? What is the man doing? The man is not breaking stride. The man is walking and saying, I have much livestock. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The next day a storm comes and destroys it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I have my health today. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Sickness comes upon him the next day. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives. The Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He's not breaking stride. That's the mark of true thanksgiving. That's the heart that understands that God is in control of my life. And that all things work together. Good things, bad things, adverse things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called. The problem with most of us is that we break stride. We are walking nicely when we have the health, when we have the livestock, when everything is all going good. And the moment adversity strikes, we pause and we say, what? How can this be? When we get to that level, And that's the level God wants us to get at. Where we understand that life is a package and God is sovereign over all of it, working through all of it. Look at Job. Yeah. You lose your cattle, you lose this, but then he began to lose his children. What are you going to do, Job? The Lord gave them to me. The Lord took them away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We sing the song, but we don't live the song. We sing the song. He gives and takes away. 
But when he gives, we are happy. We testify. When he takes away, we don't see in church. You can't. Everything goes wrong. I read a book a number of years ago. And the dedication of the book caught my attention. And the dedication was to all my enemies. And it caught my attention. Who's dedicating a book to all my enemies? And then I read close. To all my enemies. It was because of you. That I learned to pray. And seek the face of God. It is true. You, the rejection, the scorn, and the hatred that I've learned to draw close. And this book came out of that. The Apostle Paul. share this scripture with you. I'm all over the place today, but just going with the Holy Spirit. Oh. All right. Thought I had the scripture where Paul is talking about, I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. I've been cast down. I've been abandoned, shipwrecked. When Paul lists the things in 1 Corinthians, I think, chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when he lists all the things that he went through, when Paul brings his resume to the people, shipwrecks, beaten, stoned, left for dead, naked, in peril, hunger day and night. When he lists the good things, mm -hmm. What are the good things he's listing? But he writes, in all these things, I learned to be content. I know how to have and how to be in want. And I know that all things work together for good to them who love God. This Thanksgiving service and this Thanksgiving day, I believe God wants to take us to that higher level. To move us beyond a life of only good things happening that we can only be thankful when good things are happening to us. But to understand that life is a journey and all of the good, the bad, the adverse makes up who we are and where we are today. And like David, even though the pile of the bad things may far outweigh the, the good that we see, that we still have a basis for gratitude that you have brought me this far. You have brought me this far. You brought me through trials and adversities and through struggles and financial hardship. But here I am. Here I am. This is the basis. And let me close with this. But thanksgiving is not just in word. It is in deed. That heart of gratitude must find expression in works of goodness. David said, 
Who am I, Lord, that you have brought me this far? When he said this, this was at the point of rejection to, of his request to build the temple. We're going back to the beginning now. He's sitting there and he's not saying, God, I've been through, my entire life was one of hardship. Finally, I'm asking for something that will bring honor to you. The prophet comes and he says next day, God says, no, you can't do it. And that's when he says, who am I, God, that you have brought me this far? That statement came at the very junction of rejection. Can I do it? No. Thank you, God, for bringing me this far. It didn't come at a point of Nathan coming to him and say, God has validated and, 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 and said, it's okay, go ahead. Then it would be understandable that he would say, thank you, God. Who am I that you would bring me this far and show me such favor? Those words sprang immediately after a revelation of rejection. No, you can't build it. And he watches Nathan walk away. And he makes that statement. But what does he do? He says, this is what I'm going to do. If I can't build this temple, I will do all that is in my power to make sure that it's built. And he calls upon all his contacts, all the kings and all the people around the nations that he traded with and who knew him. And he collected gold and he collected silver and they brought timber and they brought cedar from Lebanon and they brought all the resources from Egypt and Tyre and all the nations, the Phoenicians brought in stuff and stockpiled all the material. Now when the message came, that Solomon was going to build it. David said. All the material is here. David did not think. That I should do anything. Because I'm rejected. David did not think. That I should not do anything. Because I'm not going to get credit for it. And he didn't get credit. What do we call that temple today? 2,000 years later, 3,000 years later. What do we call it? We call it what? Solomon's temple. But who brought all the materials for it? David. Didn't bother him. Who am I, Lord, that you brought me this far? He did all he could because he understood. And this is how the grateful heart works. He understood that he's part of a community. He's part of a kingdom. And when one member rejoices, all will, when all rejoices. That his joy was going to be, to be, do his part in that kingdom. To see the kingdom advance. To see the name of God glorified. And when he got the message, your house will build it. He said, I'm satisfied. I'm happy to be a little part of this. Who am I, God, that you would be so good to me? To allow my house to allow the line of David, the house of David, to have this privilege of building you a temple. 
David was thankful that God would allow his generations to live, his name to live. And it occurred to me last night as I'm processing and, and allowing this thing to settle into, into my heart, that David, through him, Christ came. Jesus calls himself the son of David. And through Christ, we are all now children of David. His house continues to live as God promised him through David that your name and your house will live forever. And I like what God said to him. We can talk all day about this today, but I have to let you go to eat your turkey. He said, God, I want to build you a house. And God says to him, no, you can't build me a house. Read your scripture. Go back to 2 Samuel chapter 7. God says, but I will build you a house. Anytime we decide to build God a house, God is going to turn back and say, no, I'm going to build you a house. God says, no, I'll build you a house. So the heart that is grateful does not truncate life at itself, does not see itself as an end, that I do things only for me, myself, and I, but it thinks as a part of a kingdom. It has the mindset of a kingdom that I'm part of something big. And it's not just about me. It's about for the glory of God. And so today, I leave these thoughts with you. See if I can summarize it here. Thanksgiving is not an event, but an expression of gratitude for life. For life. Here I am today. You've brought me this far. The truest expression of gratitude is the glory of God and the expansion of his kingdom. He expressed this thankfulness to God that even though he was not allowed, that his generations, his children after him, would be allowed to complete the project. He's thinking long term. He's seeing himself as part of a massive kingdom and he's doing his part those who come after me if they get the credit bless god i did my part god will honor me and when we bless the house of god he will bless our house amen today i want to challenge you to move beyond the place of where gratefulness and thanksgiving can only happen in your life when you have a financial breakthrough or when you're healthy or when your loans are paid or when your children are doing well, to move beyond that. To see God in control of your moments. To see God in charge of your days and all the events that line that journey. And whatever happens, as you live for God and as you walk with God, to understand that it's not about the immediate events and moments of the life, but the journey itself. It is where I am. David did not pick up the pile of all the bad stuff and weigh it against that. He recognized as he sat there, on that throne, oh Lord God, you have brought me this far. Through all the hate, all the rejection, all the animosity, all the rebellion, all the insurrection, all the uprising, all my personal failures, you have brought me here. You're good. You're good. 
You are good.